Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. On February 14th, 2024, if all goes well, SpaceX will launch the United States' second attempt to put a lander on the surface of the moon in the 21st century. But will this one fall prey to the same kinds of problems that the Peregrine did? What makes Intuitive Machines Lander any better than what Astrobotic has built? And what sorts of payloads does it have on board? Is it going to be able to accomplish the same types of objectives that Peregrine did? Or does it have a different objective entirely? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. In a couple of hours, I'm going to be leaving for the town of Harwell, where I am going to be meeting with a representative from the UK Space Agency, a graduate of ESA's astronaut program, actually. Really excited about that and all of the programs she has to talk to me about, but we're not talking about European space flight. We are talking about SpaceX and, more importantly, intuitive machines. Now, of course, we are all familiar with what happened to the Peregrine lander, the ill-fated first attempt of the NASA CLPS or CLPS program, the plan to scout out the lunar surface to learn as much as we can about the world where we are going to be establishing a permanent presence because there's quite a number of things that we still don't know, especially about the surface. So losing Peregrine was a pretty significant blow, not devastating because there's going to be a much larger lander that Astrobotics is going to be sending out hopefully later this year that has a much more ambitious payload. But in the meantime, Intuitive Machines and SpaceX have their own plans to go to the moon. And even though this lander does not have as many payloads as the Peregrine did, it still has some amazing packages on board that are going to give us lots of critical information about the exact region where astronauts are going to be setting down on the moon, hopefully by the end of 2026. Of course, all of us know it's going to be a lot later than that, but still, whenever they set down, they're definitely going to need the information that this lander is hopefully going to provide. Eight days from the time that I'm recording this video, SpaceX will launch the Intuitive Machines at Nova C on its long journey to the moon. After its launch, it will, of course, separate from the Falcon 9 on a direct trajectory towards the moon. This is a little different than other launches that use a more gradual orbital approach. This is going to deliver the Nova C a little bit faster to the lunar surface. Now, its primary systems, the guidance navigation and control systems and the automated flight management and software will power up and orient the spacecraft correctly before it begins its first commissioning burn. That is to say, a test burn of its primary engine, which by the way, runs off of methane and oxygen, a methalox engine, which is very rare for these types of spacecraft. So after its course maneuver, it will update its trajectory through a variety of correction maneuvers, one, two, and three. The third correction maneuver will be the most critical because it will be the last opportunity to correct the spacecraft's trajectory as it's heading towards the moon. If it's not in the correct trajectory at that time, the spacecraft is going to be lost. Now, all this happens on day one through seven. By day eight, this vehicle will be in position to enter lunar orbit insertion. And by the way, that maneuver is going to take place on the blind side or the far side of the moon. This is the largest maneuver, changing the velocity anywhere between 800 and 900 meters per second, a deceleration that much, in order to be captured by the moon's gravity. And it's a 100 kilometer circular low lunar orbit. That's the orbit it's going to be entering to prepare to land on the surface. Once again, in sharp contrast to Peregrine, 
As you can see, the probe is on a direct trajectory towards the moon utilizing this fairly powerful Methalox engine. So after the insertion, the Intuitive Machines Nova Control Team will start a cadence of activities to check the status of Nova C and its systems in low lunar orbit to get ready for landing. They calibrate the navigation cameras for lunar lighting conditions. The rotation of the moon brings the landing site into phase with the Nova C orbit after about 12 revolutions around the moon. After that, a descent orbital insertion will be carried out, and it happens on the opposite side of the moon from the landing site. The main engine fires to allow Nova C to get down to its minimum altitude, and that drops, by the way, from 100 kilometers to about 10 kilometers during this time frame. All of this happens, by the way, between days 8 and 9. Now by the end of day 9, the Terrain Relative Navigation or TRN cameras and lasers on the lander's downward side will be feeding information to the navigation algorithms which update position and velocity for course correction by guidance and control. The Nova C must then reduce its velocity even further by about 1.8 kilometers per second in order to carry out a soft landing on the moon. Some lander designs have propulsion systems with multiple jets that fire on and off during descent to achieve this. However, Nova C's design has an engine designed to continuously burn and throttle from power descent initiation until touchdown. Nova C will then pitch over at the end of its braking maneuver and will be generally upright at that point, with its now forward hazard relative navigation sensors facing the area where the lander attends to land. By the way, hazard detection and avoidance is a very big thing indeed. Intuitive machines design Nova C's trajectory to fly directly to the intended landing site. However, once it's there, the onboard software processes camera data to confirm a safe landing site and selects a new designated landing site with the slightest indication or unexpected slope. They have to make sure that it's free of hazards before they actually set down. All of this sounds very impressive, but once again, a single failure with the propulsion system, as happened with Peregrine, and the whole thing will be lost. Now, Nova C will be approximately 30 meters above the surface at this point, and the lander goes into a vertical descent at 3 meters per second. Then, the lander breaks down to only 1 meter per second, approximately 10 meters above the surface, beginning its terminal descent. And at this point, Nova C uses inertial measurements only. The inertial measurement unit senses acceleration like a human inner ear. No cameras or lasers are guiding the spacecraft to the surface because they would read lunar dust kicking up from the lander's engine, which would confuse them. And then, in a moment that will undoubtedly cause the greatest anxiety at mission control, both with intuitive machines and NASA, the lander will set down. Now, it is designed to set down at a speed of one meter per second. One thing that concerns me a little bit is this lander seems to be a bit tall and top-heavy. I've seen a mock-up of it before, and it definitely is a lot taller than you might think. Approximately 4.3 meters tall, or over 14 feet tall. So pretty tall and once again that makes me feel a little uneasy but it does have a wide landing gear so it should be okay so what's on this lander well obviously lots of nasa payloads one of the most important is the rolses the radio observations of the lunar surface photoelectron sheath <laughs> that's a mouthful and it's pretty big it weighs over 13 kilograms but what it does is it's going to study the radio radio emissions that come from the moon because that's actually been a bit of a mystery and it's also going to study the plasma environment. What does that mean? Well, the moon does not have a magnetic field to shield it from the solar wind and so charged particles bombard the lunar surface and create what's called a plasma environment when these particles strike the regolith and it levitates fine dust particles actually. And this could actually be hazardous to life support systems, spacesuits, etc. So we need to learn as much as we can about that. 
NASA actually has a total of 10 payloads on board this particular lander, also including the Laser Retro Reflector Array, which is designed to measure distance. It is a mirror system reflecting laser light directly backward to the orbiting spacecraft that emitted the laser light, in other words, another spacecraft sending the laser down to precisely determine the lander's location on the surface of the moon. NASA has been doing a lot of this this lately in order to provide a little bit more precise lunar navigation to future missions. You also have the navigation Doppler LiDAR for precise velocity and range sensing. This is something that NASA has been testing a great deal on their landers, again, to provide more precise landing solutions. Then you have the scalps, the stereo cameras for lunar plume surface studies. Now, lunar plume is going to be a very big deal, especially for Lunar Starship, because it's such a huge spacecraft and is going to require a pretty significant amount of force in order to decelerate it down to the lunar surface, which is going to create a massive plume. So these cameras are going to capture images of the effects of the lander's engine plume as it interacts with the lunar surface while it's descending. And as the dust plume settles after the spacecraft lands, as well. Now, coupled with these cameras are my favorite private commercial payload on board, which is the Eagle Cam. The Eagle Cam is going to take a lunar selfie, a third person perspective of a spacecraft landing on the moon. And the way it's going to do that is it's going to deploy the camera approximately 30 meters above the lunar surface. The camera will then hit the regolith, somehow orient itself properly, and then capture images of the spacecraft as it touches down on the moon. And by the way, this is not a NASA payload, as I said before, but a private commercial enterprise being carried out by Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Now, there aren't as many payloads on this thing as there were on the Peregrine. It doesn't have the same payload capabilities, which is a little disappointing because because there isn't going to be any instruments studying surface radiation levels on the moon. That was a very important feature of Peregrine which isn't being duplicated on this mission. But the positive thing is, this lander is setting down at the lunar south pole. At a crater called Malapare A, which is a satellite crater to Malapare, a 69 kilometer diameter crater in the moon's south polar region. And the nearby Malapare Massif is where NASA is considering putting down the Artemis 3 astronauts. And that was the NASA Viper rover that Astrobotic is going to be putting down in the same region to look for lunar ice very soon. So this particular landing is going to provide critical information about how to land at the lunar south pole because the lighting is different, the shadows are different, everything is different about this region of the moon than what we experienced with Apollo. And these are going to present unique and difficult challenges to our efforts of establishing a permanent presence on the lunar surface. I certainly hope this probe meets with more success than the Peregrine lander and that it's actually permitted to complete its mission. Yeah, I had to get that last dig in there. In any event, thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon as some wonderful people have been doing so far this year, still trying to get to that 1% threshold, 1% of my subscribers supporting me on Patreon, which would change everything for this channel. So keep that in mind, and as always, stay angry about space.